Okay, it looks like we are live here on LinkedIn. My name is Cheryl Klein. I am a mental toughness and certified high performance coach, best selling author, speaker, and CEO and founder of the Zone Lab. And I am so excited to be here today with Kelly McElhaney, who is a distinguished professor at the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business and also the founder of the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership. Welcome, Kelly, and I'm so excited you're here. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here as well. Yeah, and I, you know, we're really focused, uh, the intention for this call, not for the call, but for the live interview is to raise awareness, but also get some uncomfortable truths and also get some action items, because I don't think anyone's surprised about the fact that, you know, there's some... Um, there's some work to be done with gender equity. The awareness may be raised, but we're really not progressing as far and as fast as we can. And I've learned that when I was coaching some of the most influential women here in San Francisco and Silicon Valley and doing a lot of speaking and speaking to thousands of women um, and their male allies. And the awareness is raised, but I really want to ask you about some, the impact, the local and global impact, because I know you're having an impact you know, locally at Berkeley and here in the San Francisco Bay Area and Silicon Valley, but also across the world. And I also want to ask you about the inconvenient truths and consequences of not making some progress here. And you're also going to share some kind of some struggles that um, you've experienced along the way when it comes to being a thought leader and a huge action taker here. So if without further ado, I'd like to jump in and get started. Thank you. I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, awesome. So I would like to know, just um, maybe take a minute talking about your story, because when we read about you on paper, and when I, you know, was a fellow speaker at your Women in Leadership Conference last year, you know, it's easy to look at you and just be like, oh my gosh, you've achieved all of these amazing things. But I know after working, you know, a couple decades with world-class performers, the the journey from A to B isn't always smooth and a, and a straight line. So can you just share a little bit about your story and your mission and your philosophy. Sure, thanks for, for asking. It's a, first of all, what a great question to just for all of us to turn around and ask to the person next to us, give me a little bit about your story. To me, that's a lot about what equity fluent leadership is. It's understanding different lived experiences. So you're already exhibiting what I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I think the most significant parts of my story are just a few things. Raised in the Southeast and mostly the Midwest, I would say my formative years were in the Midwest. And I think the imprint that that has on me is this sense of uh, humility. I was taught from a very early age, this sense of um, sort of both the responsibility of privilege, which I grew up with, and the sense of humility. My dad always used to say, it is, it is the person who sweeps the emergency room floor at night who really is the most critical person that next morning, because for a top tier surgeon to come in and do perform to her best, has to be a clean and germ-free environment. So that really stuck with me. Um, my father was um, an All-American college football player, Hall of Fame at Duke University, played in the Orange Bowl, and then went on and was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles um, in the NFL. And his whole life was dedicated to back to intercollegiate athletics. And I think the impact that that had on me was he was one of the, the foremost thinkers in de developing Title IX. So that was just something that left a big imprint on me. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Very high expectations in my family, no question. Just a quick story. I was home just this past weekend with my sister and we are trying to get my, my parents set up with home health care. The home healthcare consultants who came in, we were showing her the various barriers to mobility in the house, and we walked by my father's office, and it is just an amazing shrine and testament to his success. And so she walked in and looked at all of his Hall of Fame, his um, Orange Bowl football cleats. My great my grandmother had gotten bronze, and they're hanging there, and all of his awards and honors. And she looked at my sister and I. And by the way, my sister's both a dentist and a iron woman triathlete. So a little bit of intensity there as well. She looked at us and said, wow, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to grow up under such greatness, which is both phenomenal and high pressure. And it really just, it she, that had a lot of impact on me because it did. It, there was a lot of expectation and pressure. And I think we rose to that occasion, but it also made me feel a little bit like, oh, okay. 
you know, pressure can be both good and unintentionally bad. And it just kind of just gave me this reprieve to say, no wonder I don't think I'm ever good enough. That's the kind of family because I have amazing people in my family. Made me feel normal, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Went on to college, master's degree, became a banker um, in the 80s, which for me was just an incredibly uninspiring experience, fantastic leadership training and management training, but really wondered, it caused me to do something that led me to the work I do today, which is to wonder what am I really contributing to making the world a better place other than making people with a lot of money, more money. So I went back and got my PhD and here I am still in academia since 1997 was when I finished my, my PhD. Wow, that is um, amazing. And thank you for sharing that and also sharing the whole good enough. I think at some point or I know I've struggled with the whole good enough thing too. And that is why I dedicated, you know, a couple decades of my life to figuring out who, who gets to decide who's good enough. Right. Well, at the end of the day, there's one person that gets to decide who's good enough. And we all know who that is. And that would be number one us. And so um, if you don't mind, I like to ask you, you know, along the way to your um, amazing achievements that you have had, I'm going to ask you to talk about a little bit. But have you had any missteps or struggles? Oh, yeah. When I was thinking about that question earlier, I didn't know which where to start. Um, mm -hmm. Couple of missteps. I would say far and away the biggest one is not trusting me. Uh, you just sort of talked about you only have to be good enough for one person and that's yourself. I also was born, and this has both positive and also difficult uh, implications. I was born as an empath. I'm a high empath, which means I have a high sense of intuition and it's often relatively right. I mean, I'm not always right by any stretch, but my initial hunch and intuition tends to be really powerful if I quiet myself down enough to listen to it. The second step to that is to act on it. But the challenge and the flip side of being an empath or somebody with a lot of intuition is that I've also really struggled throughout my life with depression. And that that is, uh, an, I, I call it um, an unseen disability. So we tend to, I do a lot of work around supporting people with disabilities in the workplace. And what I have learned, even in looking back at my own experience of never letting them see you sweat, quote unquote, is there are people who are walking around with a lot of non-visible disabilities and we have to stop making assumptions about people. It is highly uncomfortable for me to talk about this um, because it's not talked about, but I realize I have a platform. And I think given that I am, I am successful despite how I have struggled with depression throughout my life. I think that's something that people need to see. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. So what if you were, I mean, it's safe to say that some people out there listening are resonating with that. Yeah. Um, so can you share one thing that has allowed you to, um, you know, take what, you know, that important question that you asked, what is my place in the world? How can I make an impact? How can I make it a little better? How have you know, what is one tip or something that you can share with people that are listening who can move forward and have impact and get to that next level despite of maybe a challenge such as depression that they might be experiencing? I think it's just take a step back and figure out what you can learn from that challenge. What I'm learning from depression is that the great side of depression is that I pick up on other people's feelings. I I'm relatable because I really can cut through that sort of armor, uh, surface armor that I got so great at building for myself and um, putting it on every single day. I, I think it's the fact that, and I know this sounds so cliche, I mean, when you're in the midst of a really difficult time in your life, whether you know it's financial or mental or health or relationships or work, it's to take a moment and say, what can I learn from this that is actually part of my strength and purpose. So maybe part of my purpose right now um, at my age and being more comfortable just expressing who I really am is to talk about things that other people don't have the privilege to talk about. They don't necessarily have the platform to talk about, but I think back to your, to your question, it's what can I actually learn from what I'm going through right now and put into my repertoire of skills that will make me a better person, a better banker, a better professor, a better mother, a better partner, and I think we don't do that. We, we allow ourselves to, to wallow in the negative. And I just read this great research this morning about why the brain just latches on to negativity. It's natural for all of us. Um, but it is to say, okay, I've spent a lot of time 
thinking about the negative, that, that negative thought spiral. But what are some positives that I can just even sprinkle in? It doesn't have to be this whole afternoon of positivity, but let's just write down one positive from this experience and then keep that in my mind as well. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, I talk about a lot and we're going to talk about getting to the next level as far as really real impact and change for gender equity. But this is really the foundation because I really, at least my philosophy is that we're all born with something very special to bring into the world. And sometimes it changes as it did for you. Mm -hmm. um, but that cannot be unlocked and that cannot be brought to life if we are really struggling with depression or anxiety or something like that. So, and I will tell you after studying human performance for the last, not to date myself, over three decades, um, you know, this type of work and success and being a world-class performer, it doesn't happen in solitude. So if someone is relating to what you're saying, saying, I want to have a stake in the ground, um, I want to get to that next level, I want to have a, more of an impact, mm -hmm. I'm really struggling right now. And kind of like, uh, sometimes they might even feel like they're in survival mode, like they can get to work, they can just, they're kind of in survival mode. So digging out of that can be really, really difficult. So can you offer like, one tip or one thing to say and a lot of times getting to that next level or coming out of this it doesn't happen in solitude because we get on that loop and it's yeah. hard to get off that loop ourselves so can you give kind of one piece of advice of how to step outside this so we can move into that next level of impact you know it's it's again i've i, I used to just really not read a lot of self-help books or i didn't resonate a lot um, with self-help sort of mentality. So I'm just going to turn this off. I didn't know it was on. Um, but one of the things I have, I've really come back in my life to, to resonate with things like, all I, all I need to do is take one step, just one step. And if I just take one step in the direction towards which my sales are attacking, it's good enough for today. I was thinking back to my first day back at work after I had my first daughter. So it's your first day after maternity leave. You've been wholly disconnected, or at least I had the luxury of being wholly disconnected. And I felt like I sat down and I couldn't even understand the new technology that at the time I was at University of Michigan had put in our offices. And I'll, I'll never forget this female professor, Jane Dutton, she's quite famous for positive psychology, actually. She po poked her head in my office and said, welcome back. And you know, the whole, show me a picture of your baby. And she said, look, all you have to do today is breathe, just breathe. And it was just this aha moment of that's enough. It goes right back, interestingly enough, thematically to your I'm good enough if I just come in after four months and just breathe. And sometimes even today I go in and I'm feeling down or frustrated or stuck. And I think, just breathe, Kelly. That's if you just do that today, it's a pretty good thing because it's it's gonna keep you alive, you know. And the second thing is to reach out and ask for help. I, I see this, I you know, um, my girl's father and I have raised two really strong female, you know, two two daughters are really strong. And sometimes I look at them, particularly my oldest, and she will not ask for help. She is fierce. She, you know, doesn't want my access to my networks or to go and talk to a professor if she's stuck in the classroom. And I just look at her and say, honey, take it from me. You, if you ask for help and show just a little bit of the vulnerability or the fear that you're feeling around this, you know, um, math test that's coming up, life is so much easier. It just takes so much weight off your shoulders. So I think just reaching out to at least one other person and asking for help. Okay. So what I'm hearing is keep it simple. I call them tiny triumphs. Tiny triumphs. Yep. Right. So we can, if we can, if we're really feeling stuck in that place, like we want more, we know that we're capable of more, but we're a little bit in survival mode. Yeah. Just focus on a tiny triumph, something that we have control over that might seem really small, but it's so important. And I can tell you from a human stand, human performance standpoint, when we tend to do things that we have control over, it tends to make us most grounded. Yeah. 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 Off too much in the future, especially when we're not as stable as we could be, right. and it tends to make it worse. So that is really important. So a tiny triumph mm -hmm. and also ask for help. Yep. Those are my two. And, you know, I was in a spin class yesterday and the instructors, you know, this world sports world say, you know what? half the battle was showing up today. Congratulations, you showed up. And I always think it's true. The hardest part for me is to get from my house mentally to say, I'm going to take the time out and the effort that it's going to take to get to the spin studio. And I realized that was the hardest thing I did. Now I'm on the bike. This stuff is easy. 
Yeah. Not, not easy, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the social pressure to stay, like the embarrassment that it would cause to leave is probably greater than like Absolutely. there. You're kind of stuck there, right? Yeah. Well, that's good. You're really stuck. You're locked in on your heels. <laughs> yeah. If I'm in San Diego. My daughter dragged me to Orange Theory and there are like 50 people. And I'm like, well, there's no leaving now. Um, <laughs> but anyways, that's a hard job. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and it was all kind of a difficult difficult pill to swallow when you get your you know what kicked by your 19 year old daughter but that's a conversation for another day. Been there. been there done that <laughs> let's get to the real the i don't see the real business but let's get to the heart of this and talk about gender equality i mean this is really not just your area of expertise your area of passion your area of research you not only have passion around this but you have data around this and not just locally here at san francisco and silicon valley but really globally and so can you first explain what gender fluent means and what you're seeing out there right now and um, just kind of your, your take on where we are, where we need to go and the consequences of not making some significant progress? I absolutely can. And I was a banker in the 80s, so I very much played in the male dominated world. And sometimes I look at my world uh, in any given day and think I'm still in that same world, but I've changed and I need to rely on now how I have changed to try to change the world in terms of this whole sort of male dominated world, which obviously we are still in. The first thing is um, you called it gender fluency, which is interesting because it's, we, we, it's, it's a new concept. So I don't think, you know, I'm not, you wouldn't know what it is because we just made it up and we're designing it and developing it and testing it and teaching it. But it's actually accurate what you said, Cheryl, because I, I view my diversity as my femaleness, but what I really learned over time is we in the gender world have absolutely ignored non-white women. So we have really taken this gender equity sort of strategy and fight and feminist movement from a white woman's lens. And if you even think of things like pay gap, I mean, you and I are white women, we make 80 cents, 81 cents, if you really wanna stretch the numbers to the white male dollar, but my African-American friends earn 63 cents to the white male dollar, and my Latina friends earn 54 cents to the white male dollar. So that's why we took a broader approach at Haas, and we call it equity fluent leadership. Um, and it was an eye opener for me how narrow my lens was as a white female and how um, unacceptable that is. So we define equity fluency as uh, understand that these are leaders who understand the value of different lived experiences. So I just showed you right there that I did not have that knowledge until I got deep into this work. Um, and what I realized is that we are only as equitable as the least equi equitable amongst us. So from that pay case, Latina women are the least equitable amongst us. So if we can focus on really how to remove barriers for Latina women, everybody else just cascades up as well. Um, so the, the definition of equity fluency is that are leaders who understand the value of different lived experiences and address barriers, Latina pay gap, um, improve and increase access. How can I work at least in organizations over which I have control, increase pay for Latina women, and then finally create positive change. That's the definition of equity fluency. Okay, great. And I love that you created a new term. And I also want to take a moment to honor not just your awareness, but kind of raising your hand and saying, hey, um, there have been some inequities within our gender. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, you know, really um, been brought up too much before. No, it hasn't. And it's just, I, I, I am committed. And so thanks for receiving my forcefulness on this because I, I made a solid commitment. And I'll tell you a story. I think stories are powerful, at least they are for me. That when this became painfully clear to me, it was after our current president was elected and there was all this energy around the Women's March in Washington, DC. And we saw a fragmentation of non-white women saying, hey, no, th you know, this was not constructed with me in mind. And I was very perplexed because as a woman after that election, I was ex extraordinarily disturbed as many of us were and I called one of my fantastic, I call them members of my personal board of directors, Tara, and she's African-American. I said, Tara, can I ask you a direct question? And she's like, of course, Mac, that's what you do, bring it. And I said, how, how come black women are, are, aren't joining forces with us on this march? And she got very quiet and in her fantastically indelible, wise Tara voice, 
She said, let me ask you a question. How many Black Lives Matters marches did you attend? And it just stopped me absolutely sick with a pit in my stomach, dead in my tracks. And I said, zero. And she said, that might tell you something. And I got it. I got it so deeply in that moment. And that was a brave thing for me to ask. But it was incredibly brave of her to say that to me, to ask me that question. She called me in. She didn't call me out. She could have, you know, I would have had a lot of anger were I her. She didn't. She just very wisely, calmly called me in and said, how many Black Lives Matters protests and marches did you attend? And so I made a commitment that day to never talk about gender equity without bringing this up. So thanks for, for letting me put that in there. Yeah, you just really raised really my level of awareness in that gender equity has been kind of a blanket term that is honestly inaccurate. Yeah. Absolutely. And and again, it goes back to we are only as equitable as the least equitable amongst us. So back to, you know, a lot of what you're working on here is how do we accelerate change? If it stands to reason, or at least data suggests we focused on gender equity through a white woman's lens and towards elevating the white woman, what if we asked more black women, I'm using black women as an, as a, um, an example, it could be transgender women, it could be Latina women, um, underrepresented women to tell me about their lived experience and what if i really tried to focus on helping them on a solve for one of their barriers um that and i can't remove the barrier because i'm not that all powerful but i can certainly use the power that i do have in terms of my thought leadership to focus on one of those barriers i'm convinced we would we would raise the whole the whole floor for all women if we tried that strategy yeah, and I really believe in that wholeheartedly. And let me just put this in since, you know, my area of expertise is mental toughness and high performance and really laying the foundation to make sure that um, we can live beyond and push beyond that comfort zone, not just for ourselves, but for other women. And any time we try to push through and achieve that next level of success and impact, it usually comes with some uncomfortableness yeah. for um, for the underrepresented, but also for the advocates of the underrepresented. And I know that when I spoke at your uh, Women in Leadership Conference last May, one thing that your Dean, Ann Her the amazing Ann Harrison was talking about, yeah. at Cal, at Berkeley, at Haas, there's, the, I mean, there's no argument there that there's the best and the brightest, and they're getting an amazing, um, you know, one of the world's best educations. But one thing that Ann was really put her foot down he's like she was like ladies you know you need to speak up you need to be heard you need to have a voice so um of course we're going to talk bring in the mindset conversation so what do you think is what mindset or what skill do you think is going to be really important when we as advocates and we as underrepresented women in the workplace are going to consistently push forward beyond that comfort zone and honestly, if you don't mind me asking in a little bit more uncomfortable way, what do you think is missing? Courage. Um, we talk about with our, our work around equity fluency, it's the, the, the leader, once she or he understands the, the value of different lived experiences, courageously uses their voice. And I just feel like I, at least at my age, have never seen less courage than we see today from those in the dominant group. Uh, you know, we, we rely on those in the non-dominant group to really create change or they are more disproportionately engaged in companies and organizations. If I look around at who's on my class um, with carrying the burden of creating change. And I think it's incumbent on us in the dominant group, both to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone, because I would imagine for an underrepresented group student at Berkeley, they're pushing their comfort zone every single day because of who they are. So I think it's incumbent on us as the dominant group, and we're all members of the dominant group, the non-dominant group. So I, again, try to take the, the conversation away at times, away from gender and race and ethnicity, um, just so that we can all get it, but to push our comfort zone, to really, Brene Brown says it in her work around vulnerability. So I'm quoting Brene Brown, one of my also just heroes, her work, embrace the suck. <laughs> and I think about that a lot because it's not fun but it generally is where you learn the most and where other people are free also to push their own comfort zone. And I think you're really pushing this topic. You're flipping it on its, okay, I don't think I can swear on LinkedIn. So flipping it on its butt 
<laughs> Meaning that it's not like, hey, ladies, hey, you know, you groups that are underrepresented. It's saying uh, you're speaking to the dominant group, not right. the non-dominant group. Because a lot of times, too, what I've seen in either coaching or speaking from stages or training in companies or what have you is that sometimes change doesn't happen. Not It's not because the underrepresented do not have courage, because I concur with you. They have courage every day of the week. The problem is right. to get up right? and no, you're the groups feeling threatened and them not having courage. So that is kind of an uncomfortable topic to bring up like i call it uncomfortable truth but i really think you hit the nail on the head so um what is one you know we're we're just going to go about two more minutes here i want to be respectful of your time but can you leave us with kind of a call to action or actionable steps so if we are talking to these dominant groups how can they in turn support underrepresented women in the workplace and also share how does it help them because at the end of the day like you said it pulls everyone up yeah i think i think it's two things embrace bravery um particularly if you're in the dominant group because you you have a safer you're already operating in a safer space so how do you embrace bravery to to push your comfort zone um and the second thing it is i think we we talk a lot about and I'm not discounting this. The data shows it's true. The best sponsor to seek out as a woman in the workplace is a white man because it stands again to data and reason that he holds the you know, highest positions of authority. I would like to challenge, I'll just use white men, but members of the dominant group in whatever again that is, why don't you all or we, because I'm a white woman and member of the dominant group, why don't I seek out a mentor who is somebody from the non-dominant group? I mean, all of my mentors, until I started doing this work, tended to be white men. I worked in male-dominated professions. That's it was what it was. I work every single day, and I have a, a man. In fact, I need to tell him this. He doesn't know this, but I have just my most admired person. You're live. Sorry. I said he'll know now because you're live. Oh, okay. Well, his name is Marco Lindsay. He was our chief of staff at the business school. He's an African American man, younger than me. He now works in our diversity, equity, and inclusion team. I learned so much from Marco. He had, you know, you could say he's a lower status than me. Um, definitely as a black man, he's in the non-dominant group. I learn more from Marco than I do any Nobel Prize winning, you know, senior economists that I work with at Berkeley because they're all brilliant, you know, whatever, um, you know, crowned people. But Marco is one of the smartest guys I know. And so I've learned from that, that it's on me to seek out mentors from the non-dominant group. And that's the way that we're all gonna push forward our own knowledge around equity and inclusion. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you is the members of the dominant group, however mm -hmm. they define themselves, yep. um, should start really for change, for real change in mm -hmm. gender equity, um, and leadership to really seek out underrepresented minorities in the workplace. 100%. It will change your perspective and you will become a more powerful champion for change. So thank you for bringing that up. You're bringing up a couple things and really challenging us to take action from angles that maybe we did not think about before. Um, and so what I'm hearing is really the um, it's not all in the the um, the hands of the underrepresented group. Not only is it not only in their hands, but they're already doing it, and they need to be thrown some lifelines. And the the gender dominant groups need to push beyond their comfort zone. The dominant group in whatever situation it is, whether it's white men, white women, um, athletes. Professor with PhDs, you know, whoever is in the positions of power absolutely needs to take on the larger share of responsibility and do that with mentorship from those in the non dominant group. Yeah. And again, thank you for shining light on that because I think a lot of people maybe don't think about it from that mm -hmm. angle. So, what is, you know, one call to action that you like to take, you know, to leave with people? So, this has been very enlightening, but I, I really like, you know, my work and applied you know, um, work, I would like to leave them with. So what is one thing they can do and take action so maybe their workplace is a little bit different starting today or tomorrow? 
ask somebody in your organization, department, team who is underrepresented, what's one thing that would make your experience on this team, in this company, in this department better? And listen. Okay, I'm just writing that down and listen. Okay, so the challenge or what we'd like to invite you to do if you are uh, so gracious to spend a couple minutes of your time with us or if you're seeing the recording, is that if you are in a um, considered a dominant group and we'll let you define that yourself to seek out someone in your organization that may be an underrepresented group and ask them what you can do to further their career and also to listen to what they have to say. Absolutely. And you know, for the non-dominant group, because I don't want to just speak to the people in the dominant group since the world speaks to us the most, um, help me, help me to understand your lived experience. If I don't ask the question, tell me about your lived experience, just maybe come in and tell me one day, here's something um, that I'm struggling with. I, I, it, it's, it, it helps me to understand how best to use at least the points of power that I have. Okay, awesome. I see a new hashtag coming down the pipe and that would be help me. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be uh, super helpful to everyone just to shine the light um, and be able, there's a lot of power in articulating too, because we have to think about what we need help with. Yep be at peace with asking for help. And I will tell you that some of the world's most uh, successful people, you included, I happen to know, ask for a lot of help and they do it frequently. So thanks for bringing that up. And I wanna be respectful of your time. My name is Cheryl. I would love to make this content real for you. My work is either very privately, one-on-one, -on -one, or I do a lot of speaking in corporations and at conferences. And we have Her Impact Academy coming out, which is digital content, uh, God willing, uh, the end of this quarter. So Kelly McElhaney, thank you so much for your time. If anyone needs to get in touch with you or reach out to you or has more questions on this, is there a way that they can reach out to you? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. So I would say the first, yeah, I'm horrible on email. So sending me an email is almost the last way to get through to me. I'm always buried, but uh, LinkedIn or just sign up. Actually, the best thing you could do is sign up to receive our Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership, and it's on our website. Um, if you go onto haas.berkeley.edu forward slash Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership, a little bit long, um, sign up to hear what we're up to. Okay, that sounds great. So I encourage you to take action with that. And I believe my website is up there in the corner if I can make this content real for you, or if you'd like to join our community and see what we have coming down the pipe um, and see if it will serve you or your organization, go ahead and go to CherylKlein.com. And then just to share real quick what's coming up next for me, I'm doing a live webinar for the Women in Technology Network tomorrow at 8 a.m. And then next up is Women in Cloud in uh, Microsoft on January 25th. I hope to see some of you there. Kelly McElhaney, thank you again. I admire your work so much and I look forward to following you and seeing some of the amazing things that you continue to do. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for having me. Okay, look forward to continuing the conversation. Take care. All right, bye. Bye.